it's more easier to live with the notion that the people involved in violence were in some way monsters. I think what's more difficult is that we're not. I'm a former uh, combatant in the Northern Ireland conflict. I became involved actively at the age of 14. I went to prison when I was 17 and was released when I was 30. I became involved in the conflict as a child. The whole area where I lived was militarised. My home was raided many times by the British. My brothers were interned by the British. I'm from South Africa. I come from a time when the apartheid system in South Africa was deeply alive. And I was very much part of that system of, of deep racial segregation and dehumanisation. The first introduction I ever had with my grandfather was in prison. He was involved in the political conflict in Northern Ireland. He was one of the people that began an illegal paramilitary organisation called the Ulster Volunteer Force. That's the uniform I wore, you know what I mean? The balaclava, the guns. That's what I was involved in. If you don't bring people in, in communication, in dialogue, in, in some kind of human connection, you're not going to break down these walls. We're going to work with people in different conflict zones, people who've been involved and affected by deep, violent conflict. When you're in, in the field of conflict transformation, um, I think there, there's an expectation that you've got it all worked out mm. and your life is perfect. We are not here talking about we've arrived, you know, or that we've figured out how to do this. We are very much in the middle of, in different ways, struggling with this. You need people who, who don't necessarily have all the answers, but to have a commitment to, with other people, try and find ways of dealing with complexities. But we're all on that journey. This project really is uh, rooted in my own experience of, of the apartheid system in South Africa and trying to find ways to bring people together who have been deeply divided by violent conflict. It's, it's just really special to welcome you into this space. There are in fact very few spaces where South Africans from different backgrounds can be really honest with each other. I am a grandson of H.F. Verwoerd. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness, accepting that there are differences between people family and my community and my church and my grandfather, everybody was very much a part of that, that apartheid system that you've experienced. When I was young, we didn't, I didn't know really what you, what you were going through. I, I grew up under apartheid when I was a teenager. My, in the violence and the conflict, I saw a lot of horrible things you know, as, a, as a young boy. People get banned by tires, uh, you're getting shot and killed by police. Every aspect of your life was determined by the color of your skin. And I got involved simply because I was angry. I can literally just look across, and just on the other side of these shacks, you start to see White Stellenbosch, or the neighborhoods where I used to grow up. And people just wouldn't, even today, you would find very few people from the white community coming into Kaimandi. If the idea is, we want to create a relationship with you, then you open the door. Otherwise, you will remain a monster for the rest of your life. If you, you are left with the guilt, that's what happens. I think for me, the, the fact that Valellum is, is part of this kind of work, for me, it means a lot. I mean, for him personally, that his grandfather was a leader of, of the apartheid system. And, and then and that, you know, he made a different choice in his life to, to be part and parcel of shaping something different. I lost my 14 years old daughter 
in a suicide bombing in September 97. And ever since then I started a journey of uh, finding the reason for this senseless killing. I spent seven years in the Israeli jails when I was 17 years old. In jail, I came to discover my enemy, the other side, the suffering of the other side. In 2007, I lost my 10 years old daughter to an Israeli border police. When I was serving in the occupation as, as an officer, here I am, a good father, a compassionate father, a responsible father to my children, and I'm totally blocked and shattered to other children. On one hand, you are fulfilling your duties as a father. and the other character, the other role, you are an officer who is not allowed to allow children to pass to a hospital and so on. This situation is really, uh, was transformative for me. When I listened to Rami's story, how he lost his daughter, a suicide bombing in Israel. So after that, we don't need words. We just look at each other. We understand. We know the suffering. The ability to listen to the pain of the other. Just listen, listen, understand the origins of the fear. It will not be an easy journey. Forgiveness, it's kind of revenge. And this has happened when I met the soldier in the court. I told him that I need you to know that you are not a hero. You are just a killer. You just kill innocent girl. It's not the enemy or the terrorist. I don't want revenge because I don't take revenge from victims and he's really a victim. When I went into prison, I had completely demonized the enemy, felt a sense of superiority over the enemy, and that they were less human than I was. And part of my journey in prison was beginning to think about the suffering of the enemy, and I felt a sense of betrayal that I was even considering the suffering of the enemy. Working through that, and still working through that today, coming to a place that was confronting me with that suffering and a rehumanization, not only of myself, who had been desensitized and dehumanized by the violence, but a rehumanization of those that I seen as the enemy. My name's uh, Gerard Foster from Belfast, um, former Republican Socialist prisoner along their organization. The ILA, which is the Irish National Liberation Army. We were the worst of the worst, you know, and, and that would certainly be perceived in, by the Loyalist Unionist Protestant community, you know. Coming from the Loyalist and Unionist community, you can't deny that there was hatred there. Hatred was fed for whatever reason. How do you make sure that hatred doesn't get passed on to the next generation? Because we, did, we weren't born and didn't grow up with hatred in, in our blood. It's something that was passed to us or the circumstances that we find ourselves in. The awakening of me of the hurt and pain that conflict, any conflict causes, is irrelevant to what's said, it, it is the same. And in recognising that hurt and pain, for me, was, was a massive change in my life. I'm trying to use myself as an example to show that it doesn't actually impact your life in such a way that it changes you totally as a person, but can help, help you deal with inter internal turmoil, maybe. So part of what I'm wondering is part of that group that you want to help to heal is also part of your own healing that you need healed as well i will admit there's difficulties i will admit of issues about the past and not just the suffering that i inflicted but also i did suffer as well i mean you've said it some people say do you see yourself as a victim of the conflict and the answer is no but i did suffer because of the conflict in places where there's been conflict there's definitely a need for, for people to, to have sacred spaces to confront their own demons, where they can be able to cough out the poisonous feelings that uh, they have inside. I mean, that old UVF guy is still in me, still inside me, you know what I mean? I've chosen the go a different way, but I, I know as a human being that I still have the capacity. Because I think it, in much of this work it's about, you inevitably will see human beings at their very best, and you'll also hear about the very worst things that human beings have been involved in and, and done. I think there's something there too about, when it comes to that description of humanity, it's about the honesty around all of who we are.
really all of who we are and most of the time that we live in the world and exist it's about trying to always present the, the versions of ourselves that are the warmest or the kindest or the most beautiful or the clearest. And I actually think that part of the journey in this work is about sitting with another human being and understanding some of the darkness that they possess and recognising some of your own in that as well and still saying I still value who you are. While I sit with some of the darkness, I can also see the light. I can also see the good, the imperfections, but the good. And I'm able to hold both of those things t together. And maybe that's what it is to truly value a person, to really be able to sit with all that they are and say, I still would prefer your company. Maybe it's all we can really ask of, a, of, a, of even another human being, whether that's in a a workshop setting or in a personal capacity. Maybe that's real, maybe that's really what love is.